everyone. It's um, about 102, so we'll go ahead and get get started. Um, welcome to the next session of our wildlife program. <clears throat> Today we're going to be talking about beaver management. Uh, Jonathan Coretto from uh, USDA APHIS Wildlife Services is going to be talking to us about that. Uh, <clears throat> we have some agents with us today. Um, I don't know if everybody wants to introduce themselves. We'll just go around and, and do that and then we'll turn it over to Jonathan. All right. My name's Johnny Coley. I'm the horticulture agent for Granville and Person Counties. I'm Paul Westfall, County Director in Granville County. I'm Kim Woods. I'm the livestock agent and person in Granville Counties. I'm Charles Mitchell. I'm the Extension Director in Franklin County. I'm Matthew Place. I'm the livestock and field crop agent in Warren County. I'm Paul McKenzie. I'm the horticulture agent in Vance and Warren counties. Had to think for a minute. I understand. All right. And again, we just saw, which <clears throat> hope everybody would uh, mute, mute themselves as we go through this presentation just for uh, to cut down on back, background noise. And uh, this program will be recorded. So um, just to let you know that as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. Um, I'm going to start sharing his screen. And I'm going to put in um, a link to the, uh, the beaver management um, on USDA's site, website in the chat. So if anybody's um, interested in, in looking at that later, I will put that, uh, that link into the chat to begin with. That link I sent you, Johnny, was for the beaver page at the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission website. That was, wildlife. That was North Carolina Wildlife. I'm sorry. Yeah. That provides some history on beaver reintroduction in North Carolina and some of the other management practices for them. Can y'all see my screen now, the presentation? Yes, sir. Okay. So I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Jonathan Credo, Wildlife Specialist for USDA Wildlife Services. I cover Vance, Granville, Franklin, Warren, Pershing, and Wake Counties. So if anybody has issues with wildlife damaging their, their property or, or crops or whatever else, you can give me a call and I'll, I'll be the person to come out there and provide assistance and just whatever else y'all need with wildlife problems. Let me, we'll go ahead and get started in the, in the presentation. So today we're talking about beavers. There are aquatic rodent species in North Carolina. They average between 30 to 60 pounds, 10 year lifespan. They breed one time a year and they usually have one to six young each year. So if you leave beavers unattended in your pond in a couple of years, that that number can grow exponentially. So we'll get started with the beaver damage. Kind of how to tell if you have beaver problems. Most of the time it's, it's pretty obvious. So next few slides I'll be covering some, some pictures of different damages that beaver has caused. So we'll start off with um, Road damage. You can see in the picture on the left here of the beavers plugged the culvert. The water started washing over top of a road during a, a heavy rain event, and eventually it, it washed away the bank on the one side of the road. Let's see. So, do you have a beaver problem? So, do you have a higher than average water level, chewed or missing trees? Crop damage, and with the crop damage, sometimes it can be harder to tell. Let's say if you have a, a soybean field or a corn field, it's harder to tell from just looking from the road if you have a problem or not. I've seen some sites I pull into the areas. Farmer says, hey, I got beavers down here. I, just with a quick glance, you don't see high, high water or you don't see trees fell over. And you're kind of thinking, do they really have a, a problem or not? And once you get out there and then actually walk near the, the water source, whether it be a, a 
a pond or a stream. I don't know, I think it's in a further slide, but they'll actually make crop circles. There'll be one little path coming out of the creek, come into this corner soybean field. And they'll start in a circular motion, just making it bigger and bigger each day. I think the most I've seen is probably two to three acres of soybeans just mowed down out in the middle of the field. And for some reason, they weren't eating the, the soybeans on the edge of the field. They were going 20 yards in and then starting to circle and just kept on eating. So you can look for crop damage, chewed or missing trees. I'm pretty sure most people know what a, a beaver tree looks like. You can see in the pictures on the bottom that distinctive cutting pattern they do on trees. And peeled sticks or twigs, tracks, and of course a lodge or a dam. So here's some reference pictures of, of damage we've had before. Until we had a, a beaver dam blocking up a creek behind this person's house. And I'm not sure how these people didn't notice that that water coming up pretty substantially. I, don't, I wouldn't imagine that would happen overnight. If you look to the right, those pictures are from a looks like that's off the bank of a, a road there. So that was probably a, a culvert getting plugged on one of the DOT right of ways. And here's a picture I was talking about of, of crop damage. This one is a little bit kind of easier to tell is actually beavers. Right behind this picture was a was Highway 39 coming out of Henderson. This was about a mile south of Henderson on 39. And there's a culvert up under the road that was being plugged. You can see the water's backing into the soybeans. And then you can't tell in this picture, but in the, the back left corner of that field, there was a big area missing of soybeans where the, the beavers are out there just mowing everything down. So we'll get on the options for control. So the first option is modification of dam. We have habitat alterations, exclusion of fencing, culvert fencing, trapping, and then shooting are our last resorts. And a lot of these options, like the modification of dam and habitat alterations, they're not going to be feasible for most landowners, just for the, the amount of costs associated with both of them. So habitat alterations, you, you really don't want to cut down every tree or every living thing around a water source, or you're going to have severe erosion. But we'll get into that further in, once we get through the slides. So with the dam alterations, you can install a Clemson beaver pond leveler. And there's thousands of videos out there on the internet of how to, how to build them, how to install them. And if anybody would want to install one of these, they can call me out there. I can, we'll make a site visit and we can provide further information on how to build one and actually help the landowner build it and install it. So the benefits of this is it's non-lethal. So you won't be killing the beavers, which if you don't want to kill the animals, that's, that's a good option, but it's not going to solve the problem of the beavers chewing down trees or causing property damage. The only thing you get with this is it's going to control the water level to a certain extent. So what I mean by that is, once the once you realize that you want to install a beaver pond leveler, that water height is pretty much what it's going to be after you install the pond leveler. Because you can't, once you start lowering that water level, the beavers are going to sense that flow, that current, and then they're going to come in, rebuild the dam if you knocked it over, and then they'll actually go upstream of the, the pond level and start building another dam causing more trees to get taken down and then higher water levels upstream. But if you have an area, say you have a duck pond and you don't want the beavers to build a dam higher, you want to leave the water level the same height, this would be a good option to install one of these to kind of keep the water there 
but to stop it from exacerbating the, the situation and flood more acres. So that, but they are expensive. I mean, well, relatively expensive, depending on if you do the work yourselves or hire somebody else to do the work. Because I mean, really all it is is some corrugated pipe and then square wire wrapped around it to make a, a shield so the beavers can't plug up all the holes in the, the corrugated pipe. Next, we'll go on to exclusion, exclusion and fencing. And this also cover habitat alterations. So with fencing, this can get fairly expensive. I wouldn't expect somebody who has timber land to go out there and fence off every tree on their property within 20 or 50 yards of, of any water source. It just wouldn't be feasible for anybody. So with this, this is mainly if we have a, a subdivision or somebody has a home and they have a pond in their backyard and they like to see the beavers there. And they're not really causing the pond to flood over because they have spillways. This would be a good option for somebody like that that has a pond in their backyard. So with this, the fencing, it has to be three foot high. We recommend half inch hardwire cloth, hard, hardware cloth, the metal kind. And we recommend the metal because you can see on the picture on the right hand side, somebody put a piece of PB, uh, corrugated pipe around that tree and the beavers just, just chew through it. And I guess and they just, they really wanted that tree out their way and they can chew through that thing. Because they're basically giant rats so they can chew through almost anything. But with that metal, if they start trying to chew through it and they kind of, it'll agitate their mouth and they might get cut on it once or twice and realize there's better options for them to eat something else. Another good thing to remember if you're, if you're wanting to put up this type of fencing around your trees, you can see in this picture in the center, they left space for the, the trees to grow. Some places I've seen, they'll, people put this fence around it, put it tight up against the tree, and by next year, the trees then grew over the fence and actually causes the tree to die just from the fencing. Another thing you see in this center picture where they put that fence in the, I'm guessing the pond's on the back side of this picture from where the person's actually taking it from. They've actually put the fencing around these trees across the road there also. I mean, that's probably a good 30, 40 yards away. So those beavers will get out of that pond and travel a long distance to cut trees now. I've had places in Granville County where, I mean, we got pretty steep slopes here in some spots. The beavers will actually climb up those hills to, to get to a, a perfect tree that they want to eat. Like I said, 30 or 40 yards is, is no big deal for them to get out the water that far to go cut down a tree. Now another option you see down here in the bottom left hand corner, this person put in this square wire in front of that culvert. Now if beavers move into this area, they will claw that culvert. They'll, I mean that fence in there just helps them build a dam that much easier. But with that, I mean you see it's not really, it's probably tied with just some balance twine or some metal wire to those posts on each side of the culvert. So with that, the landowner could come in if they had a, a loader on their tractor or they just had some time on their hands, they can easily clear out that, that pipe. That way the beavers ain't building the dam up under the roadway or whatever it, that culvert's running through. They don't have to get in the culvert and be in, in danger or anything. They can easily pick that wire up with the bucket on a tractor or get down there with, with a couple rakes and rake that dam out fairly easy. And that's a good way. If you, if you don't mind the beavers in the property and they're cutting down, say, sweet gums and stuff around the water, but you don't want the water backing up, this would be a good option just to, to put one of those, those devices in in front of a culvert. You would have to come out there probably once or twice a week they remove that dam, but it stops the beavers from actually building the dam inside the culvert. It makes it easier to clean out. So 
So from that, we'll, we'll go on to trapping, trapping and shooting. So in North Carolina, it's illegal to relocate beavers, even though I think in the early 1900s, middle of night, I think around 1930 to 1950, they actually, they actually brought in beavers from other states because the population was wiped out. But nowadays it's illegal to relocate beavers. And a lot of that is you don't want to relocate a beaver and have it cause damage for somebody else. You're just moving the problem around. Also, beavers are highly territorial. So if you relocate a beaver to, to some other body's pond or, or stream somewhere else, with the amount of beavers we have in North Carolina, I believe the last survey they did was around 2 million or so beavers for the population of North Carolina. So if you move beavers to another site, there's pretty much, there's already gonna be beavers there. That stream or that pond's already accounted for by another beaver, that's their territory. So if you move a beaver in from somewhere else, what's pretty much gonna happen is those beavers are gonna start fighting and that new beaver is probably gonna get killed because it's not used to the, the new surroundings and that the beavers that are already there will, will come and attack that beaver. There's also, I mean, if you transport beavers, which is already illegal, you can be moving different diseases around. They carry giardia, which is a is pretty nasty to have in, in any water, water hole or any pond or stream. So with trapping and shooting, it can be cost effective. It's if you hired a trapper to come in and remove the beavers and go ahead and solve your problem, for, especially with landowners that have woodlots, if they're cutting down two or three trees a week, it doesn't take long for those, those beavers really put a dent in any kind of profits that landowners are gonna make from, from trees or any kind of shrubs or horticultural plants they are raising. Okay, let's see. And they also remove the problem beavers from the area. So you're not just selecting random beavers. There's actually, you're taking the problem and getting rid of it all together. So unlike the, the fencing and everything else, those beavers are still gonna be there, causing problems for other landowners that may not be able to put up the fencing or may not be able to come out there and, and clean that culvert. So that's one thing you got, you got to think about. If, if you have the time and the money to, to deal with removing beaver dams or putting up fencing versus just go ahead and get, to, get it trapped or have someone come in and lethally remove the, beaver, the beavers, that's something you have to, have to weigh yourself. If, if you want to go one way or the other. So in North Carolina, there's no hunt license required to shoot beavers that are causing property damage. I don't believe there's a, you have to have a trapping license to trap beavers on, on private land if they are causing property damage, but that'd be something to, to double check in, into if you're, if you're wanting to trap them yourself. So with that being said, there's, I mean, one of those beaver traps is $30 a piece to get one already set up and ready to put in the water. So they can be kind of expensive. I mean, each beaver site's different depending on how many, how many traps you need. You're not gonna be able to go buy one trap and, and remove all the problem beavers in your pond or stream behind your house. It's gonna take at least five or six of them. So that cost can add up fairly quickly if you're gonna try trapping yourself. And trapping yourself is, it takes a, a while to, to learn the art of trapping them. Cause you can, just like coyotes, you start trapping them and not setting the traps right. You can educate those beavers relatively quickly. And then if you do hire, hire a, li a licensed trapper later on, it can be almost impossible for them to trap and coerce, coerce that beaver to go into one of those traps. And that's where the shooting comes in. But with shooting, you know, you expect to be out there all night just to shoot one beaver. And then you're, you're out there with the bugs all night. 
So that being said, we'll get into the BMAP program. So BMAP stands for Beaver Management Assistant Program. It's cooperative funded with North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, the DOT Wildlife Services, and the participating counties. And luckily, Granville, Vance, Franklin, and Warren County all participating this year. Um, as of right now, Person County is not participating, but over the past few years, we've seen that Person County really doesn't have a beaver problem. I mean, there's we've had some out there in the lakes, like Mayo, Heiko Lake. We'll get beavers out there, but and we'll have some at some DOT sites, but for private landowners, it seems like Pershing County is is pretty well covered and with the different slopes and terrain they have over there and, and not having that many beavers. And although with that being said, Pershing County, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, when they did reintroduce beavers back in the early, well, early to mid 1900s, they, um, they actually released the population into Pershing County. So I'm guessing that those beavers just didn't make it. So with the BMAP program, there is a cost for the landowners, which is only $25 per visit. And that's not including the first initial, initial visit to come out there and just to meet with the landowner, go over the landowner's options, see what kind of beaver problem they're actually having. So, but once we signed an agreement to go ahead and start removing the beavers, and that's when the $25 per visit comes into play. And then it has here listed a $125 per dam removal fee. That's not including, I mean, if you look in this bottom right hand picture of the, the dam that guy's moving, those smaller dams is no cost to the landowner. That fee only comes into play if we have to blow up a dam or if we have to spend two hours breaking out a, a 10 foot dam. And that's only when the $125 per day dam removal fee comes into, into play. But if you call me out there, I'll go walk the whole property, take a look and tell you if, if any of the dams will, will qualify for that fee. Which most of the time, I mean, the past two years I've been working up here, I've only had to blow up one dam and that was just at the, the landowner's request that they wanted to remove with, with explosives. So I do have a video I want I want to share with everybody. Let's see if I can get that to pull up. Let's see. That's the chat box. Can y'all see the, the YouTube page now? Yes, sir. Okay. Jonathan, we're not getting any sound. Yeah. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, I think that might have fixed it. Can y'all hear the sound now? Yep. Beavers are amazing engineers of land and water. Their ability to efficiently clear trees and other vegetation and dam running waters to create lush wetlands is only rivaled by their human counterparts. Beavers are a valuable native species to North Carolina. Their wetland creating activities help clean water of pollutants and create essential habitat for waterfowl and other wetland dependent species. However, when beaver activity causes flooding in areas where people live and work, which can damage properties such as crops, timber, homes, and roadways, intervention often becomes necessary. The North Carolina Beaver Management Assistance Program, or BMAP, has been helping citizens manage beaver damage for over 25 years. 
In this program, experienced professionals trained landowners and managers to effectively resolve beaver issues on their property and, on request, can remove beavers and their dams at an affordable cost. BMAP professionals are highly trained to be able to remove even large dams quickly and safely, allowing floodwaters to drain and restoring the land back to normal. Unlike other strategies, such as bounty programs, which pay trappers to indiscriminately remove any beaver they can, BMAP recognizes that beavers play an essential role in the landscape and focuses only on removing beavers that are actively causing damage. This means the removal of beavers solves real problems where they're happening, while other beavers can continue to provide valuable natural services and viewing opportunities for North Carolina citizens. BMAP is a truly collaborative effort with resources provided at the federal, state, county, and landowner level. Its value economically, in 2018, BMAP prevented more than $10 million in damages to roads, crops, sewer systems, homes, and other property. For every $1 spent, more than five times that in resources were saved across North Carolina. For more information about the program, go to ncwildlife.org slash BMAP. Okay, that was a good little informer video that was put together in partnership between the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, our county participants, and Okay, I got that fixed. All right, so that was a pretty quick presentation. Uh, we're just covering one species. And beavers are, are pretty simple. They can be a, a major headache when, when they do move in and start causing causing problems. Um, let me see, I, I can't pull up the text box right now, so if somebody could, oh, if there's any questions, first of all, feel free to go ahead and ask them. If you have questions, you can either put them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask the question live if you like. But only thing in the chat box, uh, there's some beavers in the southern part of Person County uh, on the tributaries of the Platte River. I know when I was in Person County, I got calls now and then about beaver control. Uh, Another, Carol Carter said she had problems with beavers 10 to 12 years ago uh, and had them removed. Uh, Robert says he has beavers on his farm in southwest Person County in the Heiko Roanoke drainage area. And here's a question from Brandon. What are the requirements for a county to enroll in the BMAP program? So any county in the state can participate in the BMAP program but there is a fee associated with it. So the, it's a 50-50 contribution. So the, the county will put in $6,000 to be able to participate in the, the BMAP program. And that'll be matched by North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission and also Wildlife Services. Okay. Uh, and then on, on the say the person, person county doesn't participate, uh, in the program, uh, will will uh, you still go to Person County to to assist the landowner? Yes, I will. And I'll and with that, the initial visit out there to Person County will still be free of charge to go out there and talk to the landowner. And most of the time, it's I mean, it gets pretty expensive to start removing beavers at full cost for landowners in Person County. Yep. But we can still do it and. We're still happy to come out there, no charge, that initial visit and give recommendations on what they can do. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, question is from Peggy, do the young beavers leave after they're 
born or reach a certain age or do they stay in the in the same pond? Most of the time they'll they'll wait until they're two and a half years old to leave. So that fall of their, their second year, that's when they'll start adventuring out. But I've seen, yeah, I mean, if the, the pond's big enough or the river can su support that population, I've seen 13 beavers, which was probably over three or four years, three or four generations of beavers living in the same pond. All right, sound like your pond, Johnny. Uh, question here is how long is trapping and shooting a solution before another beaver, beaver moves in? Isn't that just a short-term solution? It can be in certain situations. Let's say if you were if you're living beside Tar River and you had a pond up, up near it, I mean, those, you're gonna have beavers in that, that pond yearly whenever the, the river floods. But as I think somebody else mentioned in the, the comments before, they've had the beavers removed and it's, I think it's been like 12 years before the beavers moved back in there. Jonathan, that was my experience on our property as well. We had beavers trapped <clears throat> and uh, it was probably about 10 years ago and, and really have seen little of any activity since then. Yeah, we've had 30 plus trapped um, in one year on our, our property. So and it was a, it's a pretty good size area, but yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> Jonathan, my question is, how do we, how do we as agents get invited to when y'all blow up the dams? <laughs> <laughs> well, you could just let me know and the next time we'll have one blow up, I'll call y'all out there. I think it's quite a sight. Each year we, well, I don't, we won't be having it this year, but we usually blow up a, a few dams at the, the Butner game lands. We don't remove the beavers. We just blow up the dams and they'll come back and fix them up. But we do that for demonstration purposes for, for NC State. I'm sure y'all be welcomed out there. Okay. Uh, another question. If the, quote, parents are removed, will any hidden young ones consider that their permanent home as well? So what we like to do when we remove beavers from a situ from a pond or any situation, we're going in there. We're removing all the beavers, and we prefer to remove the beavers in the fall or in the winter time. But we can trap them all year. But prefer to do it in the, the fall and winter when we're not having little ones run around, so they're all mature adults. And when we trap it, we trap all the beavers out of out of the area. Okay, and Marcia Seal says they are in Person County and their beaver problem is getting worse and they will need assistance. Uh, Marcia, I know uh, we posted Jonathan's contact information in the chat earlier. Hopefully you could see that. If not, call one of the extension offices, either Person or Granville County, and we'll be happy to get you in touch with Jonathan to, so he can come out and give you an assessment, uh, if that would be all right with you. Yeah. And my comments earlier about there not being a, a large beaver population in Percy County, I was just going off of not ever getting getting many calls from, from that region. So I'm yeah, guessing. I think, I think part of that's because they don't participate in the BMAP program. So. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. So Person County used to be in the BMAP, BMAP program. And um, I think the county commissioners decided to no longer fund it and maybe 2007 or eight, possibly. I don't know. I lose track of times. It was. It's. It's been a pretty good while since we had it here. I don't know. Maybe that was too far back. So I would say for those folks that are on this that have beaver issues, concerns, problems, contact your county commissioners. Let them know that um, it is a problem here in the county, and that they can participate in the program to help out residents uh, such as yourselves. I'm not sure that's going to get anywhere this year since it's an election year and everybody's trying to save money. But, you know, if they keep hearing that it's a problem for uh, residents in the county, then, you know, they may uh, look into um, participating in that program again. At one point, I was trying to, because the extension office, when we had it, was the point of contact. So the people would call me and then I would get in touch with our Beaver Management Assistance Program technician that we had at the time. Um, 
So I was trying to keep track of when people called to say that they needed some help with uh, beaver issues on their property. But if, if people don't call me, I don't know it's a problem for us to take to the county commissioners to say that they need to consider um, participating in that program again. So uh, as with everything, a lot of times squeaky wheel gets the grease. So if you're having problems, let us know so we can pass along, call the county commissioners. And uh, uh, Jonathan, I expect that you would have some information about uh, the impact of the pro program in a typical, typical county. I, I mean, I think the kind of information I've seen is that it, $6,000 is a pretty low investment and it's a pretty high value for that agricultural community to have that service available and can make a big difference on a lot of acreage in a, in a county. Yeah, we like the, I mean, if a county wants to participate, we have a lot of information we can provide to the county commissioners and whoever else makes that decision to participate or not on the cost benefits of it. I mean, like I've done, I done one job at, at Heiko Lake for a landowner and another job in central Pershing County for a farmer. And between those two, those two participants, it was, I want to say around $2,500 just for, for those two individuals to remove the beavers, mm -hmm. which that would have been, I think of 10 visits, that would have been $250 for, for the landowners at the end of the day if they were actually participating in, in the program, if Person County was participating in the program. So that those two individuals almost could have paid for the, the whole BMAP program themselves just with two beaver problems. Right, and I know when I was in Person County, I did request you know, that the county participate, but uh, a couple of times noted how many calls we had gotten for that, and I did refer some folks to, to the program anyway, but uh, uh, as Kim mentioned, uh, the Person County Commissioners do like to keep the costs down, uh, so it didn't, didn't make it through the budget process but if they, if they do get enough uh, person county residents contacting the commissioners, then uh, maybe they would pay a little more attention to that. So, yeah, anyway. that, that would surely help out. Right. Uh, Robert asked if the sessions are being recorded. Uh, we are recording them uh, and are working on trying to get them where we can release those uh, for y'all to see. Uh, one of the things that slows it down is we have to get them closed captioned in order to do that. So bear with us and we'll get those links out as soon as they're ready. Uh, so hopefully that'll be done soon. And Kim did answer that question also. Uh, and Harrison Baker asked uh, permission uh, from landowners to border your property still have to be retained, re obtained. In other words, if it's multiple properties are affected, do all the landowners have to give you permission to come out and trap beavers? Yes, if that's that's only the case if the if we're not able to set traps on their property to effectively remove the beavers, we'll say if they own just like one little corner of the actual beaver swamp, and we need to actually access the whole the whole piece of of land that's underwater to remove the dams and to effectively trap the beavers, then we do need permission from from all the landowners that border that, that beaver pond to, to actually effectively trap them and to get the water down. But if the, if the dam's on their property and we can set traps on their property and not have to touch anybody else's, we can, we can do that. All right, next question. What happens to the beavers if they're trapped? So the traps we use, they're euthanized when they swim into the trap since it is illegal to, to relocate beavers in, in North Carolina. So all beavers are, are euthanized on site and then we dispose of them properly at, at landfills or, or other sites. Okay. Uh, Peggy says that uh, they're gonna need help but they're in Forsyth County. Uh, is there someone who covers that area? Yes, and I don't have their information on me right this minute, but if she wants to give me a call, I can I can get that information to her and find a, I don't know if Forsyth County is in the BMAP program, but I can, I can check for her. Okay. 
Bob's asked, are they primarily nocturnal? He's seen tree damage, but has not seen a beaver. Yes, they're, they're primarily nocturnal. You'll, you'll catch a few here and there during the daylight or on, on colder days and rainy days, you can see them out, but they're mainly nocturnal. Okay, here's a question. A uh, person was told that if you got rid of the male, the female would move on, or was it if you got rid of the female, the male would move on? Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true because once a, a beaver, whether it's the male or female, finds a, a good place to live with enough vegetation to, to support their diet and a good area to flood and to be safe in, they're pretty much going to stay there. Okay. Uh, okay, here's a comment or and a question, I guess, from uh, Natasha. She says she's not in North Carolina. Are there ever any protections there for the beavers that supersede the needs of people? Is there an overpopulation there? By there, I mean, I guess she means here in North Carolina. Yeah. So for the, I mean, if the only beavers we come out and we'll remove are beavers that are causing imminent property damage to landowners or health and human safety concern. So we're not going out to random swamps or down every creek to remove beavers. It's only the ones causing causing problems to landowners or safety concerns wherever they they flood a river or something a road and there's actual water coming over top of the road or flooding culverts. Okay, so basically, they don't, they're not bothered until they're causing a problem somewhere. Yeah. You know, for economic damage or loss of infrastructure. Yeah. On roads. Okay. There's a comment that guess that with COVID 19 recession and lower tax revenues, it's going to be difficult to get additional public funding. That's, that's probably a good comment on that. Uh, question, can you relocate beavers to other states? No, we cannot. Okay. And Paul McKenzie put uh, a comment in there. If you're in a county other than those covered by Jonathan, you can try contacting the local county extension center. Uh, extension center number for Scythe County is 336-703-2850. And then another comment uh, that can do a lot of damage in a small amount of time. They took down a tree in one night at her pond. So as far as the numbers of beaver, Jonathan, you said there were 2 million in North Carolina estimated? Yeah, that's a rough estimate that I've gotten. I think that was back in 2010 is when they, they estimated that. So probably at least doubled by that point. I was going to say at least three million by now. Yeah. With that, but, uh, but yeah, there's no shortage of beavers in our area. No, there's not. I'd like to uh, make a comment if I can. Certainly. I have a 80 acre tree farm in Franklin County. Uh, one side is bounded by Sycamore Creek and then there are two small creeks on my property beaver ponds were there when I bought it. My goal was to coexist with the beavers. I had to have two creek crossings put in and that's when the problem started because they wanted to plug up the culverts. Yep. And I, I was glad to see you showed the Clemson leveler right up front. I've been aware of that for a long time. I've done my own modified version of it in, in at my creek crossings. And I think I've got it worked out to where uh, we have a, a compromise situation, uh, but the uh, roads will still flood when we have a big rainstorm because my pipes, I think, are too small, basically. But the beaver have not, it used to have dams all the way down to Highway 561, and they've washed out since the creek crossings were put in there. I would like for the beaver to rebuild those dams, but for some reason they won't go 
downstream. I keep hoping they will, but they have a number of ponds upstream and I really want them to be there because I want the wetlands uh, habitat for ducks and other aquatic uh, creatures. And so far they haven't done much damage to my trees. So I'm very happy with the situation. You're fortunate too on that. So <laughs> uh, we have a tree farm uh, in another state and uh, we have experienced uh, beaver damage taking down our pine trees. Yeah, I've seen that on, on another farm in, in Warren County. Mm -hmm. Once they got rid of all the sweet gums around around the pond, they went in and started gnawing on the the pine trees. Yeah. But they, they weren't there long until they realized they weren't as tasty. Yeah. Uh, what are their preferred tree species, Jonathan? Uh, sweet gum. Sweet gum and poplar. Okay, so sweet gum is good for something there. Yeah. Uh, I I would love it if they'd eat the sweet gum and poplar off my property. I'm trying to get rid of them. There you go. Uh, talk them, we'll talk them into doing that. I had another a question also, Jonathan. For a landowner to say they have some problem beavers and they want to take care of it themselves, do they have to get a depredation permit? No, they do not. Okay. I think a few slides back I mentioned they can trap and, and shoot beavers all year long as long as they're causing property damage. So there's no depredation permit needed for that. All right, good. Just wanted to, wanted to clarify that. Jonathan, this may be a little off top, topic. Paul McKenzie here, um, but uh, I'm sure you know I work in Warren County and also Vance and you know Warren County we have Lake Gaston and um, usually get two or three calls a year from uh, people that live on the lake that are having with issues coming onto their property and um, chewing ornamental trees up and stuff like that. Um, do you, and, and I think you do, are, are willing to provide assistance in those situations, am I correct? And, and if so, what, what type of you know, help do you provide in those situations? Yeah, so I'm I had a couple of calls this past year at, at Lake Gaston and I recommended the fencing option first since most people out there have, have small yards. So it's not that big of a cost for them to, to go ahead and put the fencing up. But then some people have tried it and they can't fence every, I mean, some older individuals, they can't fit, fence in all the trees on their property and then their neighbors will start having problems and it's, ends up being a whole cove and most time that's what I run into is just you have one cove where the beavers move into that that cove and and build their lodge and start wreaking havoc on everybody's yards in that area so it's just the same as as any other pond I mean it's a little bit more paddling on the on the boats but we'll just go in and get permission we can't trap them from the original landowners land we'll get permission from adjacent landowners to remove the beavers from that cove. And a lot of times most of those landowners are, are pretty happy to have somebody in there. Thanks, that, that's good to know. Uh, if you ever run into problems of beavers uh, taking down fruit trees out of an orchard? No, I haven't. I haven't had, I'm, I'm sure they would. If they had the chance to, they would. I, just have, I just haven't had any calls of, calls about it. Yeah. I know we don't have a lot of uh, fruit orchards around. We most people just have you know their their own fruit trees and all. But uh, for, in other areas of the country, I have seen that happen. You know, they'll come out and take down apple trees and peach trees and things. Yeah, I've had one place in Warren County. There's a, a truffle farm. They were worried about the, the water. I don't, the beavers weren't in there for the truffles, but they were about to cause water damage to their, their truffle field. Okay, another question came in on the chat. Uh, can they, can we do anything about beavers on uh, Corps of Engineer property that's adjacent to their property? Would they call you or would they call the Corps of Engineers? It depends on, on where the property is located. Like if, a lot of the core engineered property is owned by, is managed by the Wildlife Resource Commission. And we have an agreement with them to, to remove beavers off their property if they're causing damage. 
So I would recommend them giving me a call. We can figure out who's, who actually manages the property and see if we can get some cost share, some extra cost share. If the Corps of Engineers will, will pay for that work. Jonathan, I, I, she, she may be someone who lives on Carr Lake. Um, and you probably know if you live on Carr Lake, you're, you own up to a certain number of feet from the, you know, bank of the lake or whatever. And then that property is, is owned by the core. Um, so it may be property that's not managed by the wildlife resources commission. Would and that I would, if somebody was having problems at, at Carl Lake, since they don't own necessarily up to the waterline, that'd be something we, we would look into for them to figure. I mean, we have a good relationship with the office out of Wilmington, which I believe they manage the, the land around Carl Lake or the, the top office for, for all our Corps of Engineer lands around here. But we could look into that and and see what permissions we would need from them to trap those beavers. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. And yes, she did confirm it's on Car Lake. So okay. uh, give Jonathan a call to help figure out uh, where the permissions need to come from on that. Okay, we've still got a few more minutes uh, in our allotted hour. Uh, if there's other questions, please bring them up. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, this is Natasha, and I've asked the a couple questions about the the populations there and the protections. And uh, I'm from the south, but I'm not there right now. And I was happy to hear. I think it was uh, Michael saying that he was a tree farmer, but was working on mitigation and trying to coexist with the beaver. So I was curious, is there, uh, do you find many tree farmers down there that, uh, are you trying to have a discussion with them to hopefully use measures like that before you go to uh, removal processes? Yes, with, with most of the landowners we meet with, we we try to go non-lethal methods first. As mm -hmm. in, I think I believe it was Michael said, installing Clemson beaver pond levelers or different fencing and, and exclusion devices around the water sources to persuade the beavers to, to move on to a an easier place to live where they don't have to deal with. <laughs> with all um, fencing and is that a good on. book michael um it's showing up backwards on my screen can you see, read it it the title is called eager yeah surprising eager. secret life of beavers and why they matter it's a very excellent book on beavers. so i was it, it affirmed a lot of my positive thoughts about beavers we need more of them not less <laughs> thank you it, well, right. That's that's what I immediately go to. I'm an environmental scientist working as a conservation planner and hoping for human wildlife conflict mitigation. And so, of course, I'm curious how when these interactions occur, you know, what the ecological considerations have to be, because unfortunately, when you have a nuisance animal as they're considered uh, people want to get rid of them but again there are ecological factors to consider and it gets to be a hard thing considering what you guys are talking about where it sounds like you guys have a lot of tree farms so you know like we're it sounds like we're coming to a chicken and the egg is yep. you know there's a lot of tree farming there which seems like has brought in a lot of well, beavers Natasha, if I could interject a little bit, um, please. I'll just, I'll, I'll just offer my perspective, not so much as an extension agent as a landowner, because um, I'm one of those. Aside from being an extension agent, I'm a, a tree farm owner, and you know our, our situation was we bought a piece of property, had a lovely beaver marsh area that 
was delightful for us uh, to, you know, we have trails all through the property. We'd go out, we'd watch the beavers at sunset. We'd see the ducks fly in um, and it was really nice. <clears throat> um, and then they started damaging our crop trees. And then, you know, we started losing money. <laughs> um, and so I, I suspect a lot of times, and Jonathan, you can chime in. I don't mean to speak for you, but I, I think a lot of times we're getting the calls when it's gotten to that point where it's, it's an economic issue for the landowner. And so, you know, it's up to the landowner to decide how to balance those things. And, you know, in our case, we definitely uh, had to make the unfortunate choice in our view to, to go ahead and have them trapped out. So, but it, it's a, it's a good point and valid concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'll just, I'll just mention also, uh, I'm part of a family owned tree farm also, and there is a, a series of beaver dams upstream from our property yet, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, when they get certain certain age, the younger ones tend to move and they move down into our property a lot of times. And then when they start getting into the, into the trees and, and causing a problem, that's, we'll remove a few of them then, but we leave the mar large, large, uh, larger ponds upstream from us alone. So. And it's not necessarily want to eradicate them. We just want to get the ones that are causing problems out of the way. Yeah, and that's a lot of work we we would do with the DOT when they're causing problems for for different roadways and causing flooding issues for the roads. What we'll do is we'll we just remove the beavers within the immediate area that are building that that one dam. Yeah. A lot of times there'll be a three or four mile swamp. To upstream or downstream of, of the area we're actually removing the beavers. Right. Michael, you want to describe that picture? Yeah, uh, my phone just shut off. Uh, what? That's my big, big creek crossing. I've got two pipes there. Uh, here we go. The one closest is a cage that I built, and there's a pipe going out, and it's a Clemson leveler. It's got one and a half inch holes all around it. Uh, and it's just free floating out there. And then upstream, you see something poking up out of the water. That's a triangular cage. That was my first one. And that, it's got a similar pipe in it. I built a cage so the beaver couldn't get to it, but it turns out you really, the cage really doesn't seem to be necessary. That one is a little bit lower pipe. Uh, when my creek has normal flow, that one handles the flow and there's no flow through the one closest to the screen here. But when we have a big rain and the level comes up, then it flows through that, that other one. And what I've found is that the beaver only built- Jonathan, hold, hold that up again. I've, I've figured out how to spotlight you so that- Oh, okay. <laughs> it took a minute. I didn't know what was happening. We couldn't really see it very well. Okay. Down, down a little bit lower. There you go. I got to get the uh, chat box off my screen. There we go. Yeah, the uh, as long as the water flow is not going through the upper one, they won't dam it up. Now they've done a little damming there when there was water flow, but they stopped working on it when there's no water flow. Mm -hmm. And the two pipes, most of the creek flow goes through the pipes, and unless we have a big rain, and then we have an overflow to the right uh, where it. it because it was eroding my creek crossing, I had to put a bunch of riprap on the downstream side to stop that. But uh, that's that's my version of a Clemson leveler. And it's that that one slide you showed where the guy had the fence in front of the culvert. If he put one of these pipes in down below, once the beaver dam dammed up above it, and the, if the normal flow went through the pipe, they would stop damming it up because they only dam it up where the water's flowing. Farmer ingenuity. <laughs> I'm a chemical engineer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Retired. <laughs> now, now you're a farmer. <laughs> I'm learning. That's why I'm at these seminars. All right. I think Paul had to take a phone call, but um, are there any other, any other questions? We have reached the, it's about 201 now, but um, we'll, stick around and answer any more questions if anybody has has any 
Do you know if there's been any studies done with the correlation between the increase in tree farms with the increase in beavers in that area or what might be causing the population overpopulation? Um, as of right now, I don't know of any, any studies going on, but the North Carolina Wildlife Services State Office here, once they get everything approved at the end of October, we publishing our, I think our four or five, year, or it might be our yearly um, paper on the VMAP program. And they're going to be an article in there of the beaver research that's going on down at Fort Bragg with that includes the beaver movement and correlations to where, where they actually put their roads. Um, here's, here's my other one. This, this, they built the beaver built the dam just above the culvert pipe, which I appreciated. And, but they were, it was flowing over my road. So I put a pipe in there and, uh, it keeps the level down during normal flow and it doesn't flow over the road. And so far that's been effective. Now we'll see how long it lasts. But it's like, it's like the Clemson leveler with holes in it, it just doesn't have the screen around it. Jonathan, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think the, um, the beaver population increase, uh, that's something that's been happening over a number of decades uh, and part of the part of the issue that caused a, a, a dramatic decline in beavers was the over trapping that happened. Um, I'm thinking in the colonial area era, uh, and and then of course now we're lacking the uh, the top level predators. Um, so are, are those factors not uh, pretty significant in? you know, what we've had as far as kind of a population explosion in recent yeah. years? Yeah, I know. I believe that the last native beaver was trapped. The last recorded incident was in the 1890s or 1870s. And then after that, they, they started restocking them in the early 1930s or 1920s. So the lack of the fur market and people not not trapping them recreationally has had a significant increase in the, the beaver population. Also, as you mentioned, natural predators. So once the I believe it the red wolves were trapped out, and now we only have a small population. I believe most of those are in captivity on the coast. There's no there's no real predator for a beaver anymore. I mean, coyotes will will go after a little one. If they get the chance, but I mean they're they live in water, so the beaver and the coyote's not gonna go swimming hunting for, for beavers and then you have otters that will will attack small beavers, but there's no real predator for them anymore. And Jonathan, what would you say the percentage of uh beaver control calls are that come from landowners versus say the Department of Transportation? Um, it's hard to give you a real percentage because we keep both those kind of separate because mm -hmm. there's all separate funding. But I would have to look up some numbers. I mean, it was probably oh, no, relative, relative to each county. If we have a lot of DOT calls, we're having a lot of, of landowners call also. Okay. And then sometimes the landowners will call and we decide it's close enough to a right away for the DOT and then mm -hmm. the DOT ends up paying for it. Okay. So that, that well, allows there's, there's some areas in Granville County that uh, every few years, you know, y'all are called in to, you know, to, to open up some culverts or low bridges and things like that. But those wetland areas, basically aren't disturbed otherwise. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, we'll have some areas in Franklin County and Vance County, we go in yearly to re remove the beaver pot, well, whatever beavers that move into that, that little section of creek where the road crosses it, where they got 
a small a low low line bridge or a, a culvert right there. But other than that, there ain't the rest of the wetlands stay intact. There's beaver dams upstream and downstream of it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Natasha, I had to get on a phone call, so I, I wanted to make sure you had everything answered that you were going to mention. I'm sure I can think of a couple more, but I understand the time constraints. Okay. Anyway, I, we certainly appreciate your chiming in on this topic. So. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, because my after talking about the uh, the fact that they're um, not uh, endangered there, and now obviously the fact that you guys are talking about that there's an overpopulation, um, you know, wildlife and the environment, there's so much to consider. Mm -hmm. So now, of course, my mind goes into um, any studies or research or other methods that have been considered in reducing the population that maybe doesn't have to involve like each person going out hunting trapping um, I know some studies uh, have had issues I think it was with squirrels or possums or something and so they were looking at uh, chemical factors that would you know reduce how much their um, reproducing and things like that which also takes um gives time to the environmentalists so that they don't have to spend so much time on the ground so where you're talking about there's no natural predators and things that would typically exist in their natural habitat you know how do you get there to be more natural numbers and and that way you you're not having so much human wildlife conflict and making it easier on the wildlife biologists and technicians, you know? Oh, um, thank you for that. Yeah, and I mm -hmm. could, we have a, our staff biologist in the state office that, that is more knowledgeable on and up to date on all the, the different studies that are going on. And if you mm -hmm. want me to, I can provide you her contact information and she can give you any, or you can look up North Carolina Wildlife Services, APHIS, mm -hmm. or Wildlife Services Beavers. And there's a link where they have all the, the up-to-date studies and everything else that's going on as they're different. Okay. The, the National Wildlife Research Station in, I can't remember what state it is in now, but they're always doing research projects on finding non-lethal ways to, to handle wildlife and to prevent that human wildlife um, conflicts that we're, we're always having. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. We're about 10 minutes past the two o'clock now. So are there any other questions you'd like to ask Jonathan or any comments from anyone? What is next week's session going to be on? It's on deer control. Deer control and... Work managing deer yeah. or living with deer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's also a pretty controversial topic. I uh, look forward to uh, our presenter on that. Uh, Greg, don't Batts. Have... Greg Batts from North Carolina um, Wildlife Commission. Okay. Resource Commission. All right. <clears throat> Again, we think that's going to be a, a really good session. I uh, hope everyone can can return next week on Friday at 1 o'clock. For that, I'll try to send out a reminder with the link to everyone. Uh, we certainly appreciate everyone that's participating all through the series and, and today. I hope you've gotten some good information out of it. Uh, you know, just trying to you know, talk about different ways to work with and manage uh, coexist, however you want to term it, uh, some different types of, of wildlife and, you know, try to mitigate, try to, you know, find, find strategies that work. And we appreciate people like Jonathan and our other speakers for, for be taking the time and being willing to meet with us in this format. Uh, so any of the other team members want to say anything? Oh, one quick announcement, if I may. Um, our, of course, as you mentioned, uh, 
I believe you mentioned that this series goes through October 16th, uh, but we do have a, a bonus session happening October 20th. No, I'm sorry. This session goes through October 9th. Yeah, so just back up a week, Paul. <laughs> yeah, ends next week. So we have a bonus session scheduled for October 16th, uh, not, not looking at wildlife so much, but looking at manage, managing woodlands. Uh, so we've got, but that's going to be a little bit different time frame. So we'll give you the details or you can find them on our website. Um, uh, but go ahead and mark your calendar for the afternoon of the 16th if you're interested in a good presentation on managing your, your woodlands, uh, additional information about that. Okay, thanks, Paul. And uh, by the way, I'll just uh, congratulate Paul and Johnny for being national finalists uh, for the National Ag Agents Association for their in the search for excellence in uh, was it forestry and conservation area, Paul? Uh, they submitted a program they did last year and uh, made it made it up to the national level for for recognition and consideration. So, great job by you two. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. All right. There's no other comments. Uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll hope to see you next week. Take care, everybody. Well, I think I'm uh, I'm the host. Um, so, if, do you want me to go ahead and end it for everybody, or do you want me to pass that power to you? Uh, you can go ahead and do it. But I just want to thank Jonathan. Uh, you know, another great job. Appreciate all the the time you took to and spent with us on this project. Yeah, thank y'all for having me. Yeah, terrific job, job, Jonathan. Hopefully we can do some more presentations in person one day. Yeah, <laughs> looking forward to that. John, yeah. yeah, I had a thought. <laughs> it's probably dangerous for me to think, but uh, uh, what about doing a program on feral hogs sometime? We can do it. There's a, uh, we actually have a new feral swine biologist in our, in our district. And then we have, because personally I, I haven't had much experience with feral hogs, but we have some very knowledgeable people in the county surrounding us. I mean, we've got some in Nash County, Johnston, and even Caswell County. So we'll be happy to do it. And if we could do it in person. We can have demonstrations or make it another Zoom presentation. Well, let, we'll get in touch about that. Maybe we'll schedule a little bit later on. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, Paul. All right. I'm going to shut it down.